Here we go. Welcome to the Transform with Travel podcast, where we share stories of personal transformation and life lessons through our experiences of traveling and exploring the world. Travel is the ultimate accelerator for personal growth, and it can be the root catalyst for the pivots and plot twists we make in our lives. I'm your host, Kelly Tolliday, and it's my mission to inspire you to live life to its fullest, travel with an open mind and heart, and let the world show you a new perspective. I'm so grateful you're here with us today, so let's dive right in. Happy exploring. Welcome to the Transform with Travel podcast. I'm your host, Kelly Tolliday. And before we begin, to those listening, I'm going to ask a favor of you, and that's to click the subscribe button right now. If you enjoy these episodes, this is the easiest way to stay up to date with all of our newest episodes with incredible guests and stories. And this is by clicking subscribe. That's all. Easy peasy. And I'm so grateful to each and every one of you who listen and support this show. And now I am beyond excited to welcome today's guest, Erica Wasserman, your financial therapist. Eric and I have known each other now for about six months or so, I think. And every time I hang out with Erica or learn from her in some capacity, I always leave with a life-changing nugget of wisdom or a practical tip to apply to my life. So you are truly in for a treat today. Erica is one of 70 certified financial therapists in the world. And she has been enriching financial wellness programs all over the world with some pretty incredible companies. She's a single mom to three teenage girls with a love of travel. She's been to 46 countries and counting. And just get ready to be captivated by her passion for guiding individuals through emotional and financial empowerment. It's not just about dollars and cents. It's a transformative journey embracing a holistic approach that fosters new beliefs, leading to financial freedom, choices, and opportunities. And some of those choices and opportunities that we'll talk about today is around travel and how to live a life of travel that also feels good financially. So welcome, welcome, welcome. I'm so excited to be here. You and I have great conversations. So the fact that your listeners get to like tune in and be like a little fly on the wall for us is kind of fun. We're always like, we'll just like grab a quick coffee and then three hours later... (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> We're like, oh, shoot, I got to go. Because <laughs> it's great when you meet somebody who has so many things in common mm-hmm. and not necessarily exactly in common, but a love for learning and for people and for mm-hmm. experiences. And, Absolutely. You know, everything from travel stories to children to being entrepreneurs and growing our businesses. So it's it's always great. So yeah. welcome. I'm so excited, excited to be here. So this is actually my first in-person interview since November last year. I've been doing a couple of remotes. We took a little bit of time off in between interviewing and publishing episodes because we had so many amazing guests last time. So I'm really excited to be here in my home of Child and Company recording here with you today. And to kick off this new round of interviews, I wanted to start with these really short rapid fire questions. Normally I do questions at the end, but I thought this could be a really fun way to get to know you as a traveler, as your personality. So guests can kind of get to know you a little bit before we start. So the first one. Just really quick, first thing that comes to mind. Okay, I'm ready. Okay. okay. When you travel, do you prefer city or nature? Oh, gosh, you're really going to get me on these. Quick. <laughs> it's going to be city. It's going to okay. be city. Are you adventure seeking or do you seek out the arts and culture? Adventure seeking. Are you an aisle seat or a window seat? Window seat. Got to lean. Ooh. Are you an overpacker or a minimalist packer? Depends where I'm going. Ooh. If I'm if I'm like traveling, traveling, it's just a backpack. If I'm going away with the girls for like something more fun, then I might have a Okay. So you're in the middle here. You're in the middle. Rarely an overpacker though. Okay. Yeah. All right. And are you like you like to have your itinerary set or are you more go with the flow? I like a outline. Okay. I like to have some idea, but leave a lot of opportunity for surprises and randomness. Awesome. Okay. We're gonna start with we're gonna we're gonna we're gonna lead with that, okay? I think okay. we got a good a good sense of you got an outline for today. Sense. I got an outline for today. We are ready to go. All right. So as I mentioned in your bio, you are a financial therapist. Can you explain a little bit about what that is and your story of how you landed in such a unique, fulfilling career? Yeah. Most people, when I say, oh, I'm a fi- certified financial therapist, they look at me like the puppy dog look or the head tilts and you're like, what? So I graduated with a degree in finance. I've always grown up liking math and my dad and I bonded over math. So, you know, sitting at the kitchen table, yes, we had several fights over doing homework at night, but it was something that I enjoyed and that we talked talked about it. Then as I got older, I started trading stocks with my dad back in the day. One home computer, he would be sitting oh at it, right? And, and we'd just start talking. And so for him, it was a very natural dialogue for us. And as I got older and went into the real world, I realized that that wasn't the case for most people. So my life's a roller coaster. 
like yours and probably all your listeners as well. Never really met somebody in a straight path. That's flat Mm -hmm. ever, right? So after I graduated, I went to go work for IBM. Amazing job consulting and loved it in North Carolina. And then I moved to New York City and with a boyfriend and an apartment we probably did not or should not have afforded. Right. But that's a part of living in a city in New York, young young and dumb in our 20s. Yeah, yeah. Got married and then we moved overseas. So we did two years in Tokyo and I had my my daughter in Japan. My goal was to have a kid in every country. Didn't work out. But the first one was in Japan. Pretty cool. And then when she was four months old, we moved to Shanghai and lived in Shanghai for a year. So by her first birthday, my oldest was in six countries. Wow. So for us, just traveling was second nature. I'll come back to my love of travel, how it started. But then from there, I bawled my eyes out when I realized that I needed to leave corporate America. I was married at the time, we had a baby, and I knew that the mother that I wanted to be also couldn't be the corporate warrior that I needed to be also. Mm -hmm. And I had just spent 30 years of my life building my career, knowing that I'm going to be kick-ass in the work field, and I had no idea how to be as a mom. I never had that nurturing instinct where, like, I wanted to be at home all the time. Like, that was never me. Mm -hmm. So I remember crying my eyes out. But I also recall that when I was in China, I found an organic baby food. Now, I lived in China. Finding organic baby food was crazy. So a woman cracked, a British mom, cracked open a pouch of organic baby food. Now, nowadays, you see it everywhere. The applesauce is the baby food. But back then, nobody had had it. So Paul Lindley, Ella's dad, created Ella's Kitchen, which was the first pouch baby food. Wow. And so I started importing it from Hong Kong. Then like my friends in the UK would ship it to the US. And I remember calling them and saying, hey, when are you coming to the US? Like there's such a market here. And they said, oh, we're actually coming. The CEO is going to be in the Lower East Side next week. And I met him at Dunkin' Donuts for a cup of coffee and they hired me on the spot. Oh my gosh. Because I was just transitioning from corporate America. I was pregnant with my next baby. And all of a sudden, now I'm growing brands in the organic food space. Okay. You just roll with that life. Pivot, baby. (laughs) Right? Opportunity knocked and, you know, you took advantage of it. So I spent the next five years growing organic baby food. And in that time frame, I ended up having a couple more kids. So I ended up with three kids under the age of four and got divorced. Mm. And I moved to Florida and had to readjust my life again. So the roller coaster of life, right? Moments moving to Asia. Woo, right? Excitement. Mm -hmm. And then a twist, we moved to China. Oh, no. You know, and then another twist, we moved back to the U.S. And then, like, you know, the roller coaster of of young babies, three of them. We go up and down and up and down. Mm -hmm. And now I got divorced. Massive dip. Luckily, we did it amicably. And I was always in control of our finances. Right. So what I realized as I've gone through life is most people on this roller coaster of life aren't in control of their finances or have a strong relationship with money. When you have a strong relationship with money, there's opportunities Mm -hmm. and you have options. When you don't, often you feel defeated and helpless. And I don't want people to feel that way. So fast forward a few years, my father passes away in 2017. He's my financial accountability partner my entire life. He's the person that's like, when I got my first job and I called my dad up, I'm like, I'm buying a new car. He's like, no, you're not. Yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> He's like, whoa, 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 whoa. <laughs> also, when I went to Australia for a month after college, you know, yeah. and I was like, oh, I'm going to take a gap year. He's like, no, 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 you're not. Yeah. Like, you have a job, you have an apartment, like, you're going to work. I lost that person. Mm. And so did my mom after 50 years of marriage. And she knew where the binder was, but she didn't know what everything else was and what the meanings were. And her relationship with money wasn't as strong because it wasn't her role. Mm -hmm. Shortly after, I discovered financial therapy is a real thing. And I was like, what do you mean? I can help people with their relationship with money, a topic that I enjoy talking about. I'm never going to be great at running. I'm never going to be great at a lot of things, right? Drawing, anything. Those aren't my talents, but talking about money is one of them. So I went to Kansas State and got a graduate certificate in financial therapy. There are several schools in the country right now that have a graduate certificate in financial therapy. Half Mm -hmm. the people have finance backgrounds, half are licensed mental health backgrounds. Right, okay. Then I found there's a financial therapy association. Been around about 10 years now. And I became one of 70 certified in the field. I was actually, I think, number 15 to be certified. Oh my God. (laughs) (laughs) You're really like a pioneer in the space. Such a pioneer in the space. And I love it because it kind of reminds me back to living in China, like total wild, wild west, right? I get to create 
what I want this brand to be. So mm. your financial therapist is corporate wellness. I work with companies all over the world, which I love because money is like music. Every country, every culture has it. Mm-hmm. Just a different rhythm. Yeah. And and then I work with individuals and couples and and I created the deck of cards that we'll talk about because I want to make it approachable for everybody to talk about money. We're raised not to talk about it. In fact, 81% of people out of a survey of 2000 81% said they were taught not to talk about money, but didn't know why. Totally. So how can you get better at something? The the not being able to talk about money, I think, is really important. I, I even find now, even with my best, best, best girlfriends, we'll be talking about something and I'm like, oh, you know, it'll cost X, Y, Z amount. Like, I won't say how much the car costs or how much this, because it's like, it's a taboo to like talk about what you're spending on and how much you're spending on. And and you're here to change that conversation. I am, because here's a great example. I was leaving a networking meeting last week and the gentleman's like, oh, three of us just bought new cars this week in the same group. And they're like, because one of the guys texted his buddies and said, there's a great rebate going on. Plus you can get this tax refund. So all of a sudden a car that they were all admiring because one person decided to share. Mm -hmm. Three of them got to get in on the deal. So what happens when we don't talk about money, we also don't see opportunities. or we all lose out. Yeah. We all lose out. Yeah. And isn't it you can correct me if I'm wrong, but isn't aren't men more likely to share hard numbers on money than women are? Is that isn't I, I might be making that up. I thought I heard that somewhere. You know, you know, I, I don't know the exact fact on that, but with that it could go both ways, mm-hmm. right? Because men are less emotional, especially right. when it comes to money. So a number is a number. Right. Right. But with that being said, a lot of ego is driven from that number. Mm. So I've worked with a client who, you know, was making millions of dollars single in his 30s. It wasn't enough. Mm. And I said, well, what's your enough? And he's like, 50 million. But for him, that was, a, that was his yeah. number. You know, if, if, he, if the guy next to him said 5 million, he would look down on that person, right? So for, for most of us, 5 million is like jackpot. Right. Oh my gosh. <laughs> you know how much you know how many years I could travel on that money? <laughs> right? Yeah. But for him that wasn't enough. Yeah. So so everybody is sent not everybody. I have to watch on on that. But mm. like most people are sensitive to numbers because it all has different meaning depending on the projection and from the point of view that you're used to seeing and viewing it. Right. Absolutely, which would stem from, and I know we'll get to this in a little bit, but you you've you talk about that stemming from your money story from growing up and how your parents handled money or your caretakers handled money and all the things that kind of ripple out from there. So yeah, so when we talk about all these pivots that you made in your life and these adventures and the roller coaster of life, that kind of ties in really well with your love of travel and that sense of wanting to be out there. As you mentioned, you were adventure seeking over anything else. And can you explain a little bit about how you got so in love with travel and what what does travel mean to you? Gosh, travel's like air to me. Mm. So the first time I went overseas on my own, so I'm, I'm a solo traveler. I do travel with friends, but I also go by myself, was in high school. Oh, I, wow. Uh-huh. I went to Cambridge in the UK. Didn't know anybody. Actually, that trip, sorry, I take that back. I went with a, fr- a friend of mine. And I learned that education wasn't knowledge. So growing up, where I grew up, I was one of the top 10% of my school. Like I had good grades. Like I said, I loved math. Like I thought I was a good student. And all of a sudden I went and I met kids from all over the world. And I realized I knew nothing. I was a big fish in a small pond. Mm. And the world itself was such a big pond. And I wanted to explore. And I am a visual learner. I am experiential learner. So for me... That was it. That was my that was my bug. Of once I got it, I I just wanted to travel for the rest of my life. Yeah, I love that. I love that. It it also gives hope for parents or families that might be like, oh, my kid just isn't really excelling in school. Maybe or like, there's so many other ways to learn, and that being out in the world is such an empowering way to learn from different cultures or just learn in a different way. Like you said, experiential learning. I, I was very similar. I was in the top 10% of my class. I, you know, it was always, it, academics always came fairly easy for me. And then I would go to a different country or I'd meet another kid. Like I, we met a lot of English kids when we would go skiing in Colorado and they'd they say, oh, of course I know how to speak French. Of course I know all the, they're, they're trilingual and I'm sitting over here like barely getting by with elementary, <laughs> like Or Spanish. like they're, they're quoting like Greek literature. Exactly. And I'm like, 
Yeah. They're like, oh, yeah, that, that summer that we spent in <laughs> Cyprus or something. I'm like, cool, cool, cool. <laughs> so you do realize that yeah. the world is big and th- that's that's an important experience that you had at a young age. And so you've traveled to 46 countries and counting. You lived overseas in Tokyo and Shanghai. What did you learn about yourself living in Asia, living in Tokyo, living in Shanghai? What was the thing that you've learned or that you carry with you, I guess, now? Oh, that's a loaded question. I feel like I learned so much about myself in that process. I learned that there's a really, there's a lot of good people in this world. I think that's what echoes through and through. The expat community, especially in an Asian culture, is amazing. Mm -hmm. People just, I had a harder time coming back because the community that I moved back to, most people grew up in their whole life and I was new there and I had young babies and You know, I remember asking somebody to go for lunch, like, oh, we're busy. And I was like, I felt really alone when I came back. But when I was overseas, people were like, you don't want to go to the dry cleaners? Oh, come here. I'm going to take you. And and then I remember I was feeding my daughter and the woman didn't think my the milk was warm. And so she's like, no, 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 you come here and I'm going to warm up your milk for you. And, you know, just the kindness of people that you meet just impressed me all over the world. Now, listen, is can it be dangerous? Can it be scary at moments? Absolutely. But I found that there's more good in the world than not. So yeah. I think that's the biggest takeaway about myself, too, and, and others. I, I really appreciate that sentiment because that's something that I always say when I leave. Like, people are inherently good. People are inherently good. And if you're seeking out the good in people – nine times out of 10, it's going to be returned back to you. And of course, as you said, there's always a couple bad apples. There's always people who are being opportunistic in certain situations. But if you're giving people the benefit of the doubt, and if you truly believe that people are inherently good, then it just enhances your experience a lot more. I also agree with the reverse culture shock. I've had a couple guests on here who talk how much they didn't struggle going to Nepal or going to Thailand or wherever it is, Peru, but they struggled really like a lot coming home because it's just, you're in different energy states. You're in, you have had experiences that some of the people that you were friends with before will have absolutely no reference point (laughs) to be able to, to. And don't want a reference point. They're not interested. So it's not like, oh my goodness, like I had the best ceviche in Peru and it was this. They're like, down the street has good ceviche. Yeah, like, yeah. why are we talking about this yeah. again? You know, yeah. and so it's nice, like, when you and I met to have that kinship to be like, oh, my God, did you try? And have you been? And, you know, getting excited over the thing. So that's also important is finding your community back here. And I learned that in therapy is because I love adventure and travel. Well, now I'm a single mom with three kids. Mm-hmm. Like, how mm-hmm. do you make that happen? And, you know, when I lived in Asia, every day was an adventure. Like, you turn down the wrong street, exactly. you can't read a sign. Like, I mean, I was seeking adventure. And all of a sudden, now I lived in the suburbs. So how do you create adventure? Well, guess what? Drive an hour. Mm. You know, it was find a new park to go to or a new restaurant and 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 start exploring your own area and the time frame that I had. So I had to start learning how to do smaller experiences, yeah. but that refilled my, my cup before and in between the bigger trips that I can do. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, Alistair Humphreys calls it a micro adventure. And mm. I love, I love that that idea because even like I went to the beach the other day with the two girl, my two girls by myself and I met up with a bunch of friends and, you know, going to the beach with two young toddlers is a lot. You have to a lot of stuff to carry and it's hot and they need the snacks and all the things. And I remember leaving. And I was just like, that was so much fun. Like right. that was so much fun. Why don't I do that more? And it's just something so small, a beach that I've been to before, but I just don't go that often. It felt enough of an adventure for me to walk away feeling like my cup was filled up like that. So I do 100% agree with that statement. And with all your travels, obviously travel is a big part of your life. Financial wellness is a big part of your life. So when you're talking with clients, let's say they're going on a big trip or they want to go on a big trip. And it's something that we see a lot in research is that when people start at the beginning of the year in January, like their top three resolutions or their top three intentions for the year are typically around their physical health some usually around like building relationships or building a community and or repairing relationships. And then the third thing, not necessarily in that order, is travel. They want to travel more. They want to travel a farther trip, you know, something along the lines of that. I went to an event recently. There was about 100 women there. And they had this really cool technology where you would write – I think the question prompt was something like, what is – 
something that you really want to cultivate more of this year or something. If you had all the time and money and resources in the world, what would you do more of? And they had this thing where you would text the word and then it would show up on the screen mm-hmm. in this big in this big word bubble. And there's all these words, like beautiful words, family and, you know, wealth and all the things that we think about. But then right in the middle and the biggest block letters was travel. That was Love that it. was the number one thing that people were writing. So I took a picture of it, of course. But so we hear it. People want to travel more. They want to do more. They want to see more. But then it hits to, well, shit, what can I actually afford? Or I don't feel responsible if I spend money on travel. So how do you prepare clients or help them work through some of those financial questions or concerns in order to prepare for something that they say they value so much? Yeah. So go back to New Year's resolutions. How many people say they want to lose 20 pounds? Right. Everyone. (laughs) Hand up. (laughs) A a thousand percent, right? But do we put an action plan in place Mm. that's sustainable, right? That's why the the gym in January, right, is really busy. Everyone's really excited. And then, like, you know, go in now or July and it's empty. So the same with finances or same with travel, I'd say. So I'm going to do a word game with you. Okay. Okay. What does the word diet mean to you? Oh, God. We'll talk about First lose, thing that came losing was, 20 pounds. You're going to go on a diet. The word that came to mind was restrictive. Correct. Right? And I'll say, you're going to lose 25 You're going to lose twenty five pounds. I just increased it. <laughs> you're going to lose 25 pounds now, and you're going to do some lifestyle changes. What does that mean to you? Freedom. Lifestyle changes means freedom to me. Okay. Might be a little slower, but it's, it's, it's going to go. Yeah. Like lifestyle changes, I always think about like Ayurveda, which is like the Indian health, which is all just about like tweaking small things over time. So yeah, I guess that would be. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So let's go to, now we're going to relate it to finances. We just talked about, you know, losing 20 pounds and saving for a trip. They're very similar. So when I say the word budget, what do you think of? Like yuck. (laughs) Restrictive. My one-year-old goes yuck. (laughs) That's what I would say. (laughs) Exactly. Restrictive. You often rebel at some Mm -hmm. point and Mm -hmm. end up in a worse situation than you started. Yeah. So what I work with clients on is building a yes plan. Mm. Oh, that feels so fun. (laughs) That's your lifestyle. That's your lifestyle shift. Right. So what do you want to say yes to? So now, you know, you come to me and you say, Erica, well, let's do this. Okay. Okay. Where do you want to go next? I would like to go to Australia. Oh, beautiful. Mm -hmm. Been there a few times. Well, back to Australia. We want to visit family, but it's the flights are crazy expensive. So this is a good example. (laughs) Yes. So you want to say yes to going to Australia how much is it going to cost you to go for a family of four? Oh, yikes. Like $20,000 okay. just for flights. Can we work on an attainable goal? <laughs> <laughs> so this is what you do, though. You say, Whoa. so this is my brain. My brain's like, sure, we can do it. And then you get down to the nitty gritty. And then it's like, oh, like you get all down in the dumps because you realize that's probably not attainable, right? But it could be. So I'm joking with you about yeah. the obtainable. But So we can look at it a couple different ways. Yeah. So if flights is the most expensive part is – you know, you set up the alert for when it goes on sale. Mm-hmm. You fly economy on a Tuesday. Like you might have an overstop, a uh, layover. Overstop, where did that come Yeah, from? yeah, yeah. Right? <laughs> you, you have a layover. Like you, you know, you there is a price for mm-hmm. comfort, right? Mm-hmm. So it, so the $20,000 tickets come at a comfort. If you want to wait 18 months and have those tickets, you can. If you mm-hmm. want to go sooner, it might be looking at it differently. And so those are the things that you – Shift. Those right. are the small shifts that you make when you build your yes plan. Okay. The other piece of this is when you start saying yes, you start saying no to other things. So, yes, we're going to Australia. Okay, we're going, which means you're in action. Now, how are you going to get there? A couple of ways of doing it. I'm a big visual person. So put a picture of Australia. Put a picture of your favorite Byron Bay. You know, put a picture of your husband's family home or the grandparents. Mm -hmm. And so when you start seeing it every day, you're going to start wanting to talk about it. And it's going to be easier to start moving money over as you go. Mm. The fun thing is get your kids involved. So you know the thermometers that school uses and the church use to raise money? Well, you're going to raise your trip. Okay. So every time you put something back at Target, every time you opt to make dinner versus going out, or you run an extra piece at work, right, an extra yoga, a private client or whatever, you color it in. Mm. And as you color it in, you start getting momentum and you start feeling good. And when you start feeling good and seeing it, then you want to do more. 
and the kids get involved in it. This is a great way to get the family involved mm-hmm. on a trip because mm-hmm. now all of a sudden they're like, you're like, you want to go out for dinner or do you want to have home? And I will move the $30 over. So that's the other thing that I recommend is set up in your phone is auto transfer into okay. your fund. So don't wait for a big chunk of money to come in. If you skip Starbucks that day, cool, $5 move over. If you, again, get an extra client or a bonus or, you know, you get a second job on Saturday. So all the money that daddy works on Saturdays is going to go to our Australia fund. Right. So literally that I'm I'm thinking like Uber driver on a Saturday kind of thing. I'm sure there's other things that he could do, but. All of that money for the next eight months Mm -hmm. goes directly to those tickets. Yeah, I really like that because moving it over before you have the chance to spend it on something else that isn't that might be like a want and not a need. And then that way, like if I got an extra hundred dollars, if it's already if I just say, okay, that's going into that fund, then I don't have in my head, I don't have that to then go to Target and throw a bunch of random crap in my cart. So I like that like immediate action point to that. I also really love getting the kids involved even at a young age because I think that's important for them to see the relationship between we want to go do these things and we have to put our effort and our hearts into it. And we say that we value it and we're showing that that money isn't evil. We just have to shift our values and our priorities to match what we want. And that's where it comes into is where your financial values are and Mm -hmm. your financial beliefs. And people don't talk, again, openly about financial values and beliefs. So my value is experiences. So if you come to me and say, Erica, here's $10,000, you can update your kitchen or you can go on a trip with your kids. I'm going to take the trip. And Mm -hmm. in fact, I updated my kitchen, but I got epoxy over the the granite countertops instead of new countertops, right? right? Because I wanted to use the extra money to go travel with my girls. Absolutely. So it's about making those shifts and those balances to say, yes, I value experiences. Mm. That's great. Yeah. So then make sure your money's going there as well. And I think, yeah, that's something that's always, me and my sister were talking about it this weekend, actually. We were together for her bachelorette and we were talking about money and she's about to get married and we were just talking about, you know, people grow up with different views of money. Like my husband has a different view of money than me and, you know, everyone. Everyone has their own money story as, as we'll talk about in a little bit. And we were just saying, yeah, we grew up in a family where we didn't, like, my mom was never into designer bags. She would go to Target and we would get things at TJ Maxx. And I'm a big proponent of all of those stores. But we never grew up with the Gucci bag or the nicest car, all the things. We definitely grew up comfortable for sure. But we did take a lot of trips. We would go to Colorado. We did a lot of cruises. We went camping. Like, we went to Costa Rica. And those That's what shaped me to be able to say that I 100% value those experiences over things. And it's okay if you do value having material possessions or you love having certain brands. But like you said, being very expressive and knowing exactly what you want to value and and putting your money where your mouth is with and, and with that, you could value different things at different times. Mm-hmm. So this year, it's a massive trip to Australia. Next year, it might be a handbag. Exactly. And then the year after, it might be, you know, a trip to Costa Rica. Mm-hmm. So every – it's it's evolving. Again, I, I, I always relate it back to food and nutrition because it's the same – you know, it's always evolving. It's changing. Your body's changing. Your goals are changing. And it's the same with money. Totally. It is completely fluid. And so if you think about it, money's energy. So like it flows to you and it flows away from you. Mm. And so it's great when it comes to you and it's great when you put it in places that you value. So you just mentioned about camping and taking these amazing trips. Again, a yes plan can look differently. I just did five weeks in Portugal by myself, rented a car, you know, and I did nights in hostels. I'm 40 plus years old, right? <laughs> like I'm staying in hostels. Exactly. And it was funny, like these girls I was out drinking with them one night and they're like, I want to be you when I grow up. And I'm like, was that a compliment? Like my teenage girls never say that. <laughs> right. Like I was like, oh my God, like am I that old lady now? But at the same time, like it was fun. I love the energy. I yeah. love meeting people. And it was $25 for the night. Now mm-hmm. I splurge for the private room versus, you know, a bunk bed. Right. And then every few nights I did get a hotel on my credit card points. Mm -hmm. So I was able to do five weeks at my own pace. But if you can't, you could do five days is my point. So adjust to what you can afford without putting yourself in debt. Because what happens is you go on these epic trips and you're, you're on this amazing high and you come home. And if you put yourself in debt, 
it, it triggers so many different emotions in your body and defeat often is what I see. Mm-hmm. And that's not the emotion that you want to come home to. You want to come home to feeling more energized and more prepared and ready to take on the next adventure. Absolutely. And you don't want it to put like a black cloud over that trip like, oh, I shouldn't have stayed at XYZ. And then you put all the shoulds on it and all your stories on it. And I did really appreciate the thought around your financial values can change and shift over time, especially as you add more children to the family or you need to upgrade to your house, like upgrade your home to accommodate. And like my husband always says, you know, this is the year we're going to get the golf car and we're going to get a new car and we're going to go to XYZ's countries and all these things. I'm like, okay, well, maybe we just do the one trip, like you said, and then right. next year might be the golf cart year. <laughs> that's it. He's from Australia and that's his like pinnacle Florida life is you have a golf cart. So. <laughs> He knows so he made it he, then. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. He's like, I, I, I need to get the golf cart. So no, I, I love that, that it doesn't have to be, you know, it changes and flows every single, every day, every year, whatever. But as long as you're very clear about what those values are at that current time and what you're working on. And what I would love to say on that is you and your husband have to sit down. And that's why I created the couples card, mm-hmm. right, is sit down together and have that conversation. And in fact, get a piece of paper and or your phone or on your notes, like what are your top three financial priorities? Because they might not be the same. And then share why each one's important. That's really, really, really important. So for him, the golf cart, for you, it's a golf cart. Hey, whatever, yeah, like, right? Okay, cool. Yeah, <laughs> one, one more toy to have. Exactly. But for him, it's a status, right? The shoulders go back and like, I own a golf cart. Mm-hmm. I made it. I made it in the Total US. Total Florida man. <laughs> yes. yes. Well, we're, I, I did actually want to talk about this and we can maybe go back to a couple other questions in a little bit. But now that we're talking about partners, about having different priorities. So we get a lot of clients on our retreats who come, they're either, they have a husband or a wife, but they their, their partner doesn't necessarily value travel as much or see the value in a retreat as much. And this person really, like, for example, we had a client who has in her whole life wanted to go to Thailand and her partner just doesn't really like to travel. They know that about each other. She travels without him. It's no biggie, but this is a really big trip to do on her own, you know, using a lot of fi- finances, a lot of money to get there, to travel around, to go to the retreat. So it's a big conversation to have. And I don't know what was happening in the inner workings of their conversations, but this is an example of what we see a lot is my partner doesn't want to travel. I want to go on this retreat, but I need to talk to him about the finances. Is it okay if I go? Is it not? What can I spend on? So if you and your partner do have different priorities and you really, really value travel or you want to start traveling more and they don't necessarily want to, how, based on your experience with, especially with these couple couples conversation cards and all of your years of experience working with different people, how is the best way to talk to your loved ones about your love and passion for traveling and how you spend your money on that or potentially like your collective money if you don't have separate finances? Yeah, it comes down to communication. Communication is key in so many aspects of our relationship. And this is no different. So when you start communicating what travel does to me as a human, right? So for me as a human, it's my oxygen, right? It's what gives me air. It gives me light. It gives me purpose, which is then going to make me better. And I'm going to be better for myself. I'm going to be better for my kids. I'm going to be better for you. And then you start having conversations like what gives you air and oxygen? What is your passion? And or what would you want if you had ten thousand dollars, what would you spend it on and start having those dialogues with each other? Because when you understand your partner better and to see what they value, it helps having those conversations. And again, it might be taking turns also. So for them, it might be a golf membership. Okay, great. You know, this year. Do you know my husband? Like, (laughs) have you been talking to him? (laughs) I was a golf widow for a decade. (laughs) I'm well aware about golf memberships and the time and energy it takes. But in our conversations back then, it was that fueled him to be a better provider for us. It fueled him to be a better husband and father. And so for me as a partner, I wanted to give that opportunity to him. Mm. So those are those conversations that used to be really honest and raw. And it's sometimes hard to have those conversations. So here's a couple tips. Sitting across the table might not be the best way to do it, right? Pick your time with any conversation you have, especially with your partner. You know when the timing is not going to work. Mm-hmm. Don't don't start picking that fight. 
you know, driving is a great way of having some of these conversations. You're sitting side by side, so you don't have that intimate contact. Yeah, it's like that confrontation almost, like when you're in front of each other. Like, <laughs> you know, a dream of mine is to go to Thailand, you know, and oh, an opportunity it might come up. And just start maybe subtly, you know, dropping some hints in a very casual tone. So when the conversation comes up, they're not like, I'm leaving tomorrow, mm-hmm. <laughs> you know. Um, or like you've already made up your mind and anything other than – total agreement from your partner is a fight or is an aggression. And so when you're just like slowly starting to like put the breadcrumbs out there or like you said, just having more of that non-confrontational positioning and like literally how you're positioned in the conversation helps kind of ease the tone and ease the the defensiveness maybe. Yeah. And one of the questions is, would you like to be a part of this with me? Mm. Give the invitation. And they might be, yeah, no, that is not for me. But you go find a program or you go do that with your sister. And then all of a sudden, now you have permission, right? Now you're like, okay, we're good. Or, yeah, I would like to go with you, but I can't go for two weeks. How about we go for for a week? Okay. And, that, you know, and, and it is compromise when, you, when you're with a partner. Mm-hmm. And so you start having those dialogues. And maybe after they experience a little bit of travel, it might be something they do again and again. A lot of times people just don't know the world that's out there. And they're, they're f- afraid. So they might need a hand to hold. Yeah. And so for listeners who are listening who don't have a partner or don't have a partner that they share finances with, a lot of times I hear from people, I want to go traveling, but my parents want me to come back and finish my job or finish my degree or my parents just don't understand. I'm getting a lot of pushback from my family and they think that I should be saving my money or investing or all the things. Is it a similar approach that you would take to having a conversation with a a, a family member that's not your partner or people that you're getting pushback from who have, quote unquote, good intentions, of course, but it really infiltrates your decisions whether you go or not? Right, because we we, we as humans want approval, especially from people we love and care about. Mm -hmm. And so, yes, it's important to communicate to your parents what your plan is. You might have it figured out, kind of, sort of, maybe, right? But like, hey, you know what? I'm going to take this year because for me it means X, Y, Z. But I'm also at the same time, I put money away in a 401k already. I've established connections and I'm maintaining connections with my career, you know, so when I come back, the entry is available. They're worried about you for your big picture, Mm -hmm. you know, and you're right now only sharing you jumping off of a cliff right now, right? So now they're like, no, 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 she's lost in the world. Mm -hmm. And so sometimes it's it may be be taking a step back and and including them in your bigger picture. And I agree travel is important, especially while you're young, but so is saving when you're young. So don't overlook putting some money away Mm -hmm. in a 401k or, you know, creating the travel fund for the next trip while you're on your current trip. 100%. You know, so those are important too. And communicating it to the people that you love that I'm doing these extra steps Mm -hmm. so that way reentry isn't so hard. And also in today's global world, it's not that hard. Mm-hmm. I was just like, talking to my sister again pa- this past weekend about a friend of hers who's travel. She travels a lot, and she was like, "Yeah, she worked like six days a week, and she was a nurse, so she's making overtime on all these extra days, and that's her travel fund. Like everything, that, yeah. like, like you said, uh-huh. anything you make over that can go into your travel fund." So, I really love your tips that you've given about how to prepare financially for travel, about setting those attainable goals, and you're not saying no, but it's about setting those realistic expectations and what's possible for me and my partner might be different to what's possible for another couple or another family. So I really appreciate those very actionable steps that you've given. It's not just like set a budget and let's go. You're really making it, you're making it attainable. You're making it fun. You're making it feel like I didn't feel once think, oh, I'm going to have to really skimp on my life to make this happen. It's like, I I could do that. So with the idea of setting those obtainable goals and the vision for your life of travel and adventure. If you could give just one overarching piece of advice for people listening right now, if they want to go, let's say next year on a, on a big trip for four weeks, what would you say to them financially? Financially prepare for it. And I'm going to invite you to open up a sunshine fund. So what a sunshine fund is, your little extra fund. So this is when you are on that trip. And again, I like an outline. So Mm. all of a sudden I meet somebody really nice and they're like, oh, there's a festival, you know, a town away. Come with us. Well, guess what? Now I have an extra 100 euros to go spend on that that 
festival that I wasn't expecting. Totally. So create, when you're doing a trip, create a little buffer in there. And I call it the sunshine fun for that extra gelato or the, you know, the, the random festival that you want to go to. So that way, when you do come back, you're still whole. Yeah. So have a little fun along the way. I, I love that because what, what we said in the very beginning was how to feel good financially about your travels, right? It's like, it's like how to have fun and not be like, oh, shoot, I shouldn't have had that $10 coffee or that. I mean, maybe not a $10 coffee. But you know what I mean? Like, I mean, $10 coffee, I feel yeah. like it's everywhere. I feel here. like that's yeah. like the normal these days. Yeah. Geez. But it's how to have fun while you're traveling and feel good financially while you're doing it, coming home, like all having conversations with your partners, getting them involved. I think it's just such an important part of that process. And I just want to echo that $10 coffee. It's going to happen. Mm -hmm. You're going to make financial mistakes. Mm -hmm. We all do it. We're going to continue to do it. You know, just like eating, you're going to overeat, you know, one day. It's just recorrect and also enjoy it. So if you're, again, you're going to eat the whole piece of cake, woo, enjoy that whole piece of cake. Just like the $10 cup of coffee, sit there an extra minute. Soak it in. Because tomorrow you might do something, you know, stop at the grocery store and get the baguette and cheese, right? Yep. So, like, enjoy what you're doing because it's always fixable. It's always correctable. Money flows, so you got to be fluid with it. Mm, absolutely. G'day, mates from the land down under. Just kidding. I'm right here in South Florida enjoying a true blue Aussie coffee, pastry, and meat pie at my absolute favorite cafe here in South Florida, Bites and Coffee. That's B-Y-T-E and Coffee located in Lighthouse Point. Bite and Coffee is owned and managed by the absolute best couple from down under, Dan and Kat, who moved to South Florida from Melbourne, Australia with the dream of bringing the incredible Aussie cafe culture to the States. As someone who's lived in Australia for five years, I surely do miss my Aussie flat white coffee, brekkie buns, and sausage rolls. But what I miss more is the sense of community when you step inside your favorite cafe. You know that feeling when you walk in and they already know your order and it's ready to go? Yeah, that kind of feeling. Bite and Coffee brings the good vibes, delicious food and coffee, and the true sense of family. I can bring my little girls for breakfast and know that they are welcomed. If you're living in South Florida or just visiting and passing by, I highly recommend heading over to Bite and Coffee and grabbing a coffee with your breakfast or lunch, or even checking out their incredible wine and beer selection with a delicious charcuterie board at night. It's the perfect spot for a catch up with a friend or a business meeting. As a special gift to listeners, when you order at Bite, be sure to mention Transform with Travel for 10% off your order. So go ahead and check it out. Bite and Coffee located in Lighthouse Point. And so the last thing I wanted to ask about, and I mentioned it at the very beginning, was around this idea of a money story. And so we've, we've, we've kind of briefly mentioned it here and there, and it it really is like the foundation of everything that we've been talking about. So when you're going into these conversations with your partner, when you're going into a solo travel trip, I know a lot of solo travelers that have a hard time parting with the money or they get really nervous about the finances and really understanding what your money mindset or your money story is kind of helps you, one, deal with another person who might have opinions about how you spend your money on travel, deal with the conversations you have with yourself around whether you should have that $10 coffee or the baguette and cheese in the pub. And I remember me and my husband fought so much when we lived, we lived in Asia for a year and we were traveling around Thailand and we would go to these restaurants and it'd be the difference between like a $3 meal and a $5 meal. And my husband's like, we're going for the $5 meal. And I'm like, no, we can't, we can't do that. Are you kidding? We got to go to the $3 meal. Or we'd be in Bali and there was this one spa that had a $20 massage for 90 minutes. And I was like, that's more money than I've ever spent on a massage in Asia. <laughs> like, I can't do that. I can't, like, I was so like, right. so fixated on the number of things rather than the overall comfort or maybe not getting sick while you eat or <laughs> like all the things, right? So can you just explain maybe leaving like a little bit of a journal prompt or like a little noodle, something for the people to noodle on about what is that money mindset and how is that so important with how we view how we experience the world? Yeah. So I do an exercise con called unlocking your money mindset and it, do it goes from your past, your present to your future. So we get our money beliefs from three things, three main areas versus our background. So I shared with you, my dad and I talked about money. It was a very open dialogue. 
when we went shopping with my mom, she'd hide the shopping bags in the car and we'd, you know, run in when my dad wasn't looking. He paid the credit card bill. Like, I don't understand that as an adult, but like as a kid, like that was my background. I also only shopped at TJ Maxx. Same $100, but would never go into Neiman Marcus for $100. Absolutely. Right? Like, (laughs) and and it was so funny because nowadays she'll be like, oh, my friends, they only shop at Bloomingdale's. I'm like, you could too, right? Like, you don't have to buy 10 black shirts. You could buy one. Yeah, one really nice quality shirt. (laughs) But that's my background. Mm -hmm. Right? Mm-hmm. And then you add in religion. Money is greed. Mm-hmm. Money doesn't buy you happiness. You give a certain amount to charity. Men hold the finances. You know, it's only been about 50 years where women can actually get credit cards or loans on their own. So a lot of that plays a part. And the third is experiences. So for you, for me, travel is like a great experience and where we want to spend our money. If somebody had an awful travel experience, they're going to be like, that was a waste of money. My luggage was stolen. The, I got food poisoning. I never want to leave my hometown again. So you have to understand that everybody comes with a different, unique mindset, even within the same house. You and your sister have different mindsets. My sister and I have different mindsets. Mm. So a writing prompt might be, what is your financial mindset? Are you in abundance or are you you thinking about that $10 coffee? Nothing wrong with either of them and a balance is great. But what rules have gotten you there? What family rules? What experiences have gotten there? Like we only shop at TJ Maxx. Again, that rule doesn't serve me. If it's the same hundred dollars, mm-hmm. so it's the shift in how you're seeing the world can help you because we don't talk about money, so we don't know what we're doing. I equate this to when I got married or we're dating. My parents yelled across the house, right? So you know, turn on channel seven, you know, yeah. whatever it was, right? Back in the day before cell phones and texting, you just yelled across the house. I didn't know any different. I thought that was normal. And then when I met my partner, he's like, no, my parents don't yell. They actually like get up and like walk (laughs) over and be like, did you see what's on Channel 7? It was so foreign for me. And it's the same with money and money values and money conversations. We don't know what's happening behind closed doors Mm -hmm. until we start talking about it and seeing what's behind. So open the door to conversation with some friends. That would be the other tip. Absolutely. I think that's so important just – Getting your frame of reference of who you like when you're going to your partner to have that conversation about going to the trip in Thailand or you want to go to a a retreat in Portugal or a retreat in Greece and you have to come up with your, you know, PowerPoint presentation. Like, why should I go on this retreat? Like, but coming at it from the perspective of what's their frame of reference with their money mindset. And if you don't know that, if you've never asked them, if you've, if you never asked yourself, then it makes that conversation a lot harder, more defensive, probably more prone to fights or, not getting what or getting what you want but not feeling good about it like so having those open conversations is so important and you're making assumptions making assumptions they're absolutely. just going to say no mm-hmm. right but why are they saying like you need to have the dialogue so th- that's actually how I got it the let's talk finances exactly. couples edition I was at a bar and there was a couple next to me 10 year anniversary doing conversation cards and I was like that's brilliant she goes, yeah, I don't want to sit here staring at one another, right? We're 10 years married. Yeah. And so every anniversary when we go away, I get a new deck of cards. And I'm like, people come to me all the time saying, I don't know how to start those conversations. So if the questions range from, did you get allowance as a kid? How did you use it? Mm-hmm. To, are you worthy of the money that you make? That's a toughie. <laughs> right? Like, it, you know, and it varies. Like, what's your favorite bill to pay? And we, we can leave on yeah. this. Is What's your favorite bill to pay? My favorite bill yes. to pay? Oh, my gosh. Well, I think as much as I don't like to pay a credit card bill, I like paying my JetBlue credit card bill because every dollar we spend towards it gets us closer to our mosaic status with JetBlue. Like it unlocks a whole range of travel perks. So as much as I don't like to pay that, it makes me feel good knowing we're working towards something. I love that. Yeah. I love that. And everybody has a different answer. Yeah. Right. When my kids were younger, it was my babysitter, right? I had a, Oh, I had, hell yeah. <laughs> right? I had, an, I had au pairs. When I had three kids under four by myself, right? So I had au pairs. And that was the best money I ever spent because it helped me be a human, mm-hmm. you know. And so it, it, it will it will vary. And again, it flows. Now my kids are older. It, it has changed. Now it's my home. I've provided them a home for 12 mm. years, the same house. So it, it changes for everybody. But I love it's JetBlue because I have a JetBlue card also. Yep. And I will never get to mosaic status. So. <laughs> well, yeah. To be fair, my husband works in construction. So like all the expenses goes off that one. Yes. So it's kind of like we win a little bit there. And but. I shouldn't use the word never. But yeah. if, I, if I focused on it, I could. But 
I love that that's your goal. And then you're working towards your Australia trip. It all ties in together. Exactly. Love it. Well, I absolutely love these cards. For those watching on YouTube, it's the Let's Talk Finances Couples Edition conversation cards. And you can get these on Amazon, correct? Amazon, yes. Yes. And I've been like throwing them at people who I know I gave it to my sister and her fiance. I'm so excited to just like you said, have these open conversations and not just with your partner. If you don't have a partner, like talk about it with your girlfriends. Like like you said, you don't know what you're missing out on or potentially losing by not having these conversations of, hey, did you did you know that so-and-so dealership is offering 4% interest instead of 6%? Like you never know. Yeah. Like those little tiny shifts and changes make big amounts of impact in what you could use in disposable income for travel or for health or for whatever your values are at that time. So Thank you so much. I'm so excited. I'm like, now I'm like frothing to go talk to Sam about our money mindset and go do all those fun things. So we always end these with some questions at the very end. We started with rapid fire just to get to know you a little bit. And these will go just a little bit deeper. And for those listening, I had four questions that I did for about 30 episodes. And now I switched them up just because, you know, you got to switch things up a little bit. Okay. You gotta, so I'm the first one with these the questions. The roller coaster of life, baby. You're, yeah, you are one of the first ones with these All questions. Right. So number one is what country or place has made the biggest impact on you? Thailand's the first one that comes to mind. Yeah. I just fell in love with Thailand. The people, the smiles, the kindness, what was what we talked about, is in all the world, it's Thailand. Amazing. And what is your go-to travel accessory? Like, if you can only go with one thing, what, what what's your must-have? Sneakers with insoles in them. Oh, <laughs> love it. <laughs> <laughs> I took my really cute Nikes. Like, I don't know if my kids will know the name of them. But they're not blazers because they're the low top. But And I put, like, my Hoka, like, extra insoles in them. I can walk for days. Game changer. I, oh, my God. I was all over Europe, and I'm and I look cute. And so I realized, like, the extra insert made a difference. You know, you could be cute and still have orthopedic. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. But you know what? That does make a big difference because when you're walking, let's say, in, like, flip-flops or Birkenstocks or, like, I've something. I've done like, it all. You I've You know, you've tried the wedges. I've tried mm-hmm. to be cute in the heels. I've tried to, like, you know, work shoe or whatever. A cute sneaker, especially right now, like yeah. the sneakers are in. They're, they're in. But the extra sole, that has been yeah. the and We game have to changer. take advantage of it while it's in because exactly. Lord knows in six months we're going to be still rocking the sneakers and their kids are going to be looking at us like, no, <laughs> you got this wrong. <laughs> okay. And the last one is what's the biggest life lesson that you've learned while traveling? Hey, hit me on that one. <laughs> oh, I felt that one in my heart. <laughs> and the crowd goes quiet. Yeah. <laughs> Life's fragile. Hmm. Yeah. Take advantage of the moments and the people that you're with. Yeah. You know what? It's so so crazy you said that. Because this morning my husband he was leaving for work and he's like, just another day. And I said, it randomly just came to me and I was like, yeah, another day that you got to wake up and be here. Because there are many of our friends and family who, who didn't. And yeah. let's, like, let's do it. You know, let's get after it. <laughs> and take those moments, mm-hmm. right? So, again, small micro adventures or the big ones. And because you don't know who's going to be here next year with you or next day. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, that's oh. the biggest lesson. Thank you so much for being here and sharing your wisdom and your story. I'd love for our listeners to be able to connect with you online. Or what's the best way for them to shout out and say hi? My website's yourfinancialtherapist.com, Instagram, yourfinancialtherapist. Um, so feel free to, to look me up over there, send me a message, or drop me an email mm-hmm. at erica, E-R-I-K-A, at yourfinancialtherapist.com. You got all all the all the URLs, the, the all, the, all the domains. All the, yes. <laughs> amazing. Well, thank you so much. Thank you. I feel like we could talk for eight more hours. <laughs> I love it. I love it. Thank you so much for having me on, and Absolutely. I can't wait to do it again. Thanks for tuning in to another episode of the Transform with Travel podcast. Don't forget to hit subscribe so you never miss an episode of inspiration, adventure, and exploration. If you felt inspired by this episode, please rate and review in whatever streaming app you're listening from. This allows us to spread the word even more and continue to serve up weekly doses of adventure. As always, we'd love if you could share the episode with someone in your life who you think will benefit from this conversation. Thanks so much for listening. This is your reminder to get out there and keep on exploring.